All right, welcome back. Now we're on chapter 32, spinal injury and spine motion restriction. Our objectives are, our overview is anatomy and physiology of a spinal injury, emergency care for suspected spinal injury, guidelines for spine motion restriction, spine motion restriction techniques, and special considerations. Case study. Remember, I'm going to read the case study and then show you the questions. I encourage you to Write down the questions in case you want to go back and answer them as we go along with the PowerPoint. EMTs arrive on the scene of a person who made a hard landing while skydiving. Sarah approaches the patient, instructing her not to move, and immediately provides inline stabilization of the head and neck. The patient, a 25-year-old female, landed on both feet and is complaining of pain in both ankles and her lower back. How could this mechanism of injury lead to injury of the spine? What signs and symptoms of spinal injury should the EMTs assess for? So I'll go back and let you read the case study again. Remember, you can pause and play and rewind this video as it is in YouTube format. There are the questions again. Go ahead and pause them. Pause the video and you can write them down. All right, introduction, vehicle collisions, falls, and recreational activities pose a risk of spine injury. Spine include injury, injuries to the spinal column and to the nervous system. Patients with spinal injury must be handled in such a way as to avoid movement of the spine. All right, our anatomy and physiology of a spinal injury. The nervous system. Parts of the nervous system are two major functions, communication and control enables awareness of and reaction to the environment, coordinates body responses to changes in the environment. Here are the components of the central and peripheral nervous systems. As we see the central nervous system, which is the brain, all right, components of the central and peripheral nervous systems. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system consists of the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. Functions and divisions of the nervous system are voluntary, which influences the activity of skeletal muscles. So that means whenever you say, I want to pick up this cup, you voluntarily enact the nervous system and you grab the cup and you pick it up. Autonomic influences the activities of involuntary muscles and glands, which uh, consist of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. But also, autonomic means that you do not have to tell these muscles or these or this part of the nervous system to work. Uh, it just does it on its own. It's like your heart beats on its own. You don't have to remind it to, and so do your lungs. They, they, they inhale and exhale on their own. You don't have to tell them to. <clears throat> The skeletal system consists of the skull, which is the cranium and the face, the spinal column, 33 vertebrae in five divisions, vertebrae bound together by ligaments, vertebrae are separated by disc. So whenever you um, hear someone say they had surgery because they had a, a bulging or a slipped disc, this is what they're talking about. All right, here's the vertebral column. The, on the left, you see the spinal, it says spinal curves, but on the left, you see cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. Uh, those are the, uh, the different uh, sections of the spine that you'll have to know. And on the right, you see the vertebrae are break, broken down into the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and cosageal. So you will need to know those. I guarantee you they will show up on the test again. And you will have to know them in order. Because we can't have the lumbar above the cervical, obviously. The spinal cord consists of nerve tissue. Spinal cord tracks are motor tracks that carry impulses to the same side of the body. Pain tracks carry impulses from the opposite side of the body. And light touch tracks carry impulses from the same side of the body. So our motor tracks, uh, when we notice those nerves, or the spinal cord tracks that come off of our cord onto the, say, the left side. Um, 
when we use our left arm, that's the same side of the body. But pain, it carries from the opposite side of the body. And then light touch tracks, obviously, from the same side, just like the PowerPoint says. So if I touch a hot flame with my left finger, uh, then I will feel it on the same side of my body. All right, common mechanisms of spinal injury include vehicle collisions, which are the most common. 85% of patients with a spinal fracture or dislocation do not present a neurological deficit. Improper handling of a spinal column injury may result in neurological injury. The spine is susceptible to injury from several mechanisms. And here we go, we can see the mechanisms of spine injury. On the left, you see flexion injury, uh, where the, the spine flexes as he falls down the stairs. A hyperextension, maybe from a rear end crash is what it's showing you there. And then a flexion rotation, where not only is the spine flexed, but it's also rotated. Then you see compression, um, diving into the pool, hitting your head at the bottom, compressing the spine together. Then distraction injury, you'll see distraction again. Um, obviously that is a suicide, <clears throat> but it's basically where the spine has been stretched. <coughs> Excuse me. And then penetrating injury where something penetrates the body and enters the spine. Spinal column injury versus spinal cord injury. Spinal column injury is injury to the vertebrae, which, fra which include fra fractures and dislocation and results in pain or tenderness. Remember, the spinal column is what encompasses the spinal cord. It's the outer bone that protects the spinal cord itself. So one of the, either the spinal column or the spinal cord can be injury or both. So be thinking about that when you think about when, when you deal with patients with um, back injuries or possible spinal cord injuries or spine injuries. A spinal cord injury is a damage to the nervous tissue and a disruption in the movement or sensation. So if you have someone who has tingling or inability to move after there was a vehicle crash or some kind of trauma um, where you see some of those uh, previous injuries like this, then you know that's... Uh, the, the, the column could be affected, but it's not causing the numbness or the par paralysis. The injury to the spinal cord would be calling that, would be causing that. Excuse me. So, a complete spinal cord injury. Remember, this is the nervous tissue. A transection of the cord, loss of motor, sensory, and autonomic function below the site of the injury. Transection of the cord means it is severed. So there's a loss of motor, sensory, and autonomic function below the site of the injury, or maybe not severed in half, but injured uh, enough to where it has stops all of the signals that go down through that uh, nervous system tissue. Then spinal shock. Spinal shock also can result in initial presentation with complete loss of function. Um, the, 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 I guess the bright side of spinal shock is that um, you can come out of spinal shock and, and regain um, those sensory functions again. Spinal shock, the loss of sympathetic control, uh, neurogenic hypotension. We know what hypotension is. It is a lowering of the blood pressure. Vasodilations uh, will be, be caused by vasodilation of arterioles or arteries. Uh, diminished release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So um, whenever, we, whenever we experience something very tragic or very traumatic or exciting, our, our adrenal glands uh, uh, send off epinephrine or norepinephrine, and it kind of makes our body react uh, as a defense, and we, um, we kinda, it kind of guards us from, from a severe injury. But um, when we have neurogenic hypotension, um, the vasodilation of the arterioles um, and then there's, there's going to be vasodilation. So there's going to be that lowered blood pressure. And then you have the, uh, diminished release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is going to relax the body even more. 
and then the skin is warm and dry and the pulse rate is normal um, because it's not a hemorrhagic uh, type of uh, condition but it's a neurogenic so um, imagine the body really really relaxed and um, which could cause loss of sympathetic control an incomplete spinal cord injury injury does not involve all three tracks some but not all signs of spinal injury are present the pattern of lost functions is reflected in different syndromes now I want to tell you um, if you if you're dealing with the trauma patient and you suspect and they, they have some neurological deficits uh, meaning like uh, weakness paralysis uh, things of that nature and um, if they're if they're conscious but they're not complaining of an injury or pain then don't forget you need to do a stroke assessment on those patients because um, you want to you want to rule out the possibility of stroke but also if they they may have a spinal injury and you, you don't want to rule that out and also um, you want to if they do have the stroke uh, symptoms you want to get them to the appropriate facility as quick as you can all right here cross sections of the spinal cord showing the H-shaped gray matter surrounded by white matter. Um, illustrated here are the three most common types of incomplete spinal cord injury. The area uh, areas of injury are highlighted in red. Each results in a distinctive syndrome or pattern of sensory, sensory and motor deficits. Uh, central cord syndrome results from injury to the central cord. And we see that in figure A. So this is spinal cord not the spinal column uh, in figure B we see anterior cord syndrome results from injury to the anterior cord which is the front remember anterior is front and then brown sequard syndrome results from injury to the right or left half of the cord so if you see brown sequard that means uh, it's going to be injury to the right or left side of the cord the spinal cord now are we going to be able to assess that are we going to be able to see that um, in the field uh, no we're not but we're going to be able to see signs and symptoms of that so we need to be hey look this might be a spinal cord injury because a patient presents with this deficit and it says going to be uh, each results in a distinctive syndrome or pattern of sensory and motor deficits and a syndrome uh, is just a compilation of signs and symptoms uh, that are together that's causing something, which would be the syndrome. All right, central cord syndrome. The medial portion of the motor and pain tracts control the upper extremities. The lateral portions of the tracts control lower extremities. In central cord syndrome, the medial portion of the spinal cord is injured. Anterior cord syndrome, syndrome, and it's like I said, this is going back over what we're looking at here. So you need to know if if you see uh, any of these signs and symptoms or these deficits here, you know what you're looking for: central cord, anterior cord, which is loss of function in motor and pain tracts, but not in light touch tracts. The patient experiences paralysis and inability to feel pain below the level of injury, but can detect light touch. Brown-Sequard syndrome. Injury affects only one side of the cord. Loss of motor and light touch sensation on the affected side. Loss of pain sensation on the side opposite of the injury. Okay, so if we are have loss of motor and light touch sensation on the left, we're going to have a loss of pain sensation on the right. These are things you can check in the field. If you chose C, you would be correct. If the central portion of the spinal cord is injured, the patient may present with weakness or paralysis and loss of pain sensation in the upper extremities while lower extremities have good function. All right. Emergency care for suspected spinal injury. Assessment-based approach. Scene size up. Crashes. These are your mechanisms of injury. Crashes, falls, blunt or penetrating trauma, sporting or recreation injuries, gunshot injuries, and electrical injuries. An MOI heightens your suspicion that a potential injury might have occurred. It does not provide any evidence that an injury did occur. So it might have occurred, but you always need to have that high level of suspicion. 
Do, uh, deduce the MOI from the evidence at the scene. Determine if such me a mechanism could have injured the spine. So we're going to look at what we see on the scene and based on how our pa patient is presenting and say, did that cause the injury or could that have caused a spinal injury? And if it could have, we need to proceed uh, thereof and see and, and make sure we pay attention to the signs and symptoms that would present with spinal injuries. Front end damage and a driver's side windshield fracture indicate that the driver was probably thrown head first into the windshield. Um, I can't see the driver's side fracture windshield fracture, but maybe right here. So I would assume that that's what they're saying is that the driver was thrown into that windshield right here. Compression injury. All right, which mechanism of injury consists with potential uh, for spinal injury? Oh, excuse me, with mechanism of injury consistent with potential for spine injury. So um, during your primary, uh, immediately provide inline manual stabilization of the spine. Um, if you suspect spinal injury, use the jaw thrust maneuver to open the airway and follow local protocols for spine motion restriction. Listen, um, I know that jaw thrust thing might sound weird and... You might you know, say, I'm going to forget to do that, and I'm going to do a head tilt chin lift. But, man, you got to pay attention to that because you got somebody that's been involved in a trauma. They're unconscious, can't talk to you, um, not responding. You need to do a jaw thrust no matter what because um, you just don't know if that spine's been injured. And you don't want to be, and if it's not, or if it is injured and it's not that bad, if you do a head tilt chin lift and injure it more, then that's just going to, it's going to not only make you feel bad, but keep you negligent and things like that. You don't want to do that. Perform manual stabilization of the spine based on mechanism of injury. Um, maintain manual stabilization until a thorough assessment does not reveal indications of promoter restriction or spine motion restriction has been accomplished. So what they're saying there is that hold that manual stabilization. That means with your hands, uh, we will show you how to do that. And until that assessment indicates that there's no spinal injury, like we've done an assessment when that patient is talking to you and they can tell you what happened, and you check everything, pulse motor sensory, and it indicates that no spine motion restriction is needed. Or if they're unconscious and spine motion restriction has been accomplished, uh, conscious or not, and then you can release manual stabilization. Provide spine motion restriction on patients with positive mechanism of injury who have an altered mental status, have painful distracting injuries, and cannot effectively communicate with you. If they can't tell you what's going on effectively, then we are going to assume and we are going to treat them based on that. Your high priority patients are the ones who are unresponsive, responsive but unable to obey, obey commands, abnormal respiratory pattern, or obvious signs of spine injury. During your secondary, main, maintain inline spinal stabilization, conduct a physical exam. After assessing the neck, apply a cervical collar. Assess pulses and motor and sensory function. Assess flexion. Have the patient see if they can flex their arms and you can assist them in, inward. Ex extension. So here in flexion, you want to grab them if they're responsive. Grab their hand and tell them to pull your hand inward as if they're flexing. And then to push your hand away in extension. And then finger ab ab abduction is have their fingers spread out. You grab their fingers and tell them not to let you close them. So you would squeeze, not, I mean, not, obviously not very hard, but you would try to close their fingers together and they would have to try to hold you open and see what their strength level is. Fing finger abduction, have them close them, put your hand there and say, open your hand, open your fingers. Assess the wrist and hand, move it up and down, put pressure on it, see if they can move it how how their how's their strength same with the feet so plantar flex in and assess the doors flex in so up and out pain response in the hand it's using the back of a q-tip just touch it push in a little bit see if they feel it same thing in the foot don't make it to be a sharp object where you cause an injury that won't be good Light touch response, flip it over, use the Q-tip or a cotton swab, 
You can even use some folded up gauze just to rub lightly on the hand. Same thing on the foot. All right. Still in your secondary exam, uh, on your posterior, which is the back, log roll the patient with spine motion restriction maintained to assess the posterior body. Palpate the area of the spine gently. We are not log rolling patients unless we have a C collar in place and someone is at the head that can support the head as we log roll the patient. Uh, depending on the size of the patient, you might need someone else to help you log roll the patient, and that is okay. Don't feel bad about that. We are here as a team, and we are here to help. All right. After all that, you need to get a baseline set of vitals. If the brain or spinal cord is damaged, vital signs may reflect neurogenic hypotension. We just talked about that. If the hypotension is severe and the patient has tachycardia, suspect bleeding as the cause of shock. Severe hypotension, tachycardia, a low blood pressure, Fast heart rate. I, don't, I shouldn't have to explain to you what those words mean, but I am. Hypotension, low blood pressure, tachycardia, fast heart rate. Suspect bleeding as the cause of shock. If you can't see the bleeding, then you need to look around the body. You should have already exposed the body and make sure you can't see any signs of internal bleeding. You may not be able to, but you still need to be uh, have that in the back of your mind so that when you show up at the hospital, you can tell the doctor or the nurse that, hey, um, I'm suspecting uh, hemorrhagic shock because of the signs and symptoms that I've found. Hypotension and tachycardia. Obtain a history from the, res from the responsive patient. If, there's, if he's not responsive, then you try to get a history from someone else. If the patient is unresponsive and there's no one there to get a history, then you don't get a history. You do the best you can. Assess for allergies, medications, past medical history, and last food or drink. That's going to be your sample. And then events prior to the onset of signs and symptoms. All right, here's some signs and symptoms you need to check out. Tenderness along the spine. So when you log roll that patient, if they're responsiveness, you need to palpate. Don't just rub your finger down the back of their spine. You need to be pushing and prodding and poking and see if there's any tenderness. Uh, is there any pain associated with movement? Pain independent of palpation or movement. So are you feeling any pain without me touching you or without moving? Uh, deformity of the spine on palpation. Soft tissue injuries. Uh, you would see those and maybe some light abrasions or lacerations and then also in contusions. Is there any numbness, numbness, tingling, weakness, loss of sensation or motor function, loss of bladder or bowel control, priapism, or impaired breathing? Priapism is in males an erection and it's caused by a spinal cord injury. Assessment findings that are indications for spine motion restriction. You want a, uh, if you're looking, um, if you get a GCS of less than 15, I shouldn't have to tell you what a GCS is, but it is a Glasgow coma scale. And if it's less than 15, then um, you may have some, um, you may have an indication for spine motion restriction. Uh, don't just use that as your spine motion restriction. You have to couple it with things like what kind of injury or what kind of uh, mechanism of injury was it? Uh, was it a, uh, is there any injuries? Are they telling you they, you know, hit their head or anything like that? I would, I would look at other signs and symptoms in a history. Uh, sometimes a GCS of less than 15 could just be maybe intoxication, drug overdose, uh, could be a medical problem, but don't just start slapping C collars on people if they got a GCS of less than 15. Um, suspected trauma, traumatic brain injury, altered mental status, pain or tenderness of the spinal column, paralysis, weakness, numbness, and tingling. If you got those things in a GCS less than 15, C collar. Deformity of the vertebral column under the influence of drugs or alcohol, cannot communicate effectively, has a pain or distracting injury, has a painful distracting injury, excuse me. Complications of spine injury, inadequate breathing effort. Paralysis of the respiratory muscles can lead to respiratory failure. Yes, we have respiratory muscles, and yes, they can be paralyzed. So there you might have to ventilate. So you better start practicing your mass seal and your breathing rate. Know what your breathing rates are for different age groups. Also, uh, the ability to place a king tube properly. Respirations may be shallow with little movement or chest or the chest or abdomen. 
provide positive pressure ventilations. Always provide positive pressure ventilations if breathing is inadequate. Paralysis, paraplegia, quadriplegia, hemiplegia, more common in head injuries than a stroke. So um, had a 16-year-old, had a massive brain bleed on the right side. His left side, uh, leg, his left leg was par paralyzed, well, he couldn't move it, and uh, weakness in his left arm. Uh, in inadequate circulation or some uh, complications of spinal injury. Vasodilation leads to hypotension and poor tissue perfusion. So if you got poor tissue perfusion, you're probably going to have some pale, cool, maybe clammy skin. It may be warm and dry, and the heart rate is normal to slightly increased. Just depends on uh, if it's that that neurogenic, um, the neurogenic injury, neurogenic shock. You know, you'll have that warm, uh, pink and dry skin, and a normal heart rate. So just like I said, you can't just take one vital sign and make your decision. You have to take all of the little clues, put them together, and then make your decision. All right, emergency medical care. Use your standard precautions, PPEs, gloves, face mask, uh, eye protection, gown if need be. Um, you never know um, now these days who may be infected with some sort of virus. And if you think they are, you should, you should be on the uptake of what's going around. Uh, flu, coronavirus, things like that, and you should know the signs and symptoms, especially if you're working with patients, because you need to recognize them so that you can protect yourself. Uh, establish inline spinal stabilization if you need to. And here we go. Inline spinal stabilization. Keep the head in a neutral position and the nose in line with the patient's navel, or for you people from the south, the belly button. So this is good. Um, he's doing well, but also... Um, some things have uh, improved. If you take your um, your hands and you put your fingers uh, behind her shoulders and your thumbs over her collarbones and use your forearms to support the head, um, it just makes for a more stable um, a more stable spine motion restriction or inline stabilization. And if you remind me, I will tell, I will show you this in class during skills. All right. Airway and breathing. Use the jaw thrust maneuver if necessary. Provide positive pressure ventilation for inadequate breathing. Maintain the SpO2 greater than or equal to 94%. Suction secretions without turning the patient's head. Do not turn the patient's head. That's why we have rigid catheters that we can stick in their mouth and suction secretions. Assess the pulse, motor function, and sensation in all extremities. Assess the neck before applying a cervical collar. Please, 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 please palpate the cervical spine before you apply a C collar. And then apply your cervical collar. Provide spine motion restriction of the patient on a long backboard. After placement on the backboard, reassess pulse, motor, and sensory function, and transport. Uh, some companies have gotten away from the use of spine boards unless they absolutely need them to move patients. Uh, with injuries, I will tell you that I am a firm believer in scoop stretcher. Um, it is easy to get into hard to reach places, and once it's assembled on the patient, it is just like a long backboard, and then you can take the patient, especially if they don't have any um, severe spinal injuries. Once you get them on the stretcher, you can unhook that scoop stretcher, and and they're more comfortable uh, on your, your stretcher mattress. Um, I will tell you that a lot, a lot of people found themselves, uh, even with spinal injuries, uncomfortable on long backboards on stretchers. Um, it's just, uh, it's become, the long backboard has become a tool for movement uh, rather than uh, more of a tool for immobilization. We still use it for immobilization, but um, you'll see that it's become a, more of a tool for movement. Uh, in weird places than, than, than immobilizing somebody. But anyway, you'll, you'll see that as you do your clinicals and as you uh, go out in the field and actually work in this job. All right. During your reassessment, check your airway breathing, vital signs, comp, uh, complaints if your patient is responsive, and check your interventions. Please keep track of all interventions you do. All right. Case study. The patient is alert and oriented with a patent airway and adequate breathing. She has a strong radial pulse of 88 per minute. She has movement and sensation to pain 
and light touch in her upper extremities. <clears throat> Excuse me. She has sensation to pain and light touch in her lower extremities, but bilateral ankle injuries make assessment of motor function different. Not difficult, sorry. What equipment will Sarah and Angela need to provide spine motion restriction for the patient? Describe the procedure Sarah and Angela should use to provide spine motion restriction for the patient. I would advise you to pause the video now so that you can write these questions down, and hopefully you've had a chance to answer some of the questions from the first case study. All right. Guidelines for spine motion restriction. The historical perspective, spinal immobilization versus spine motion restriction. Spinal immobilization. Until 2013, immobilization was the standard of care for any patient found to have an MOI, which may result in spinal injury. ASEP stated its belief that if efficiency of current practices outside in out-of-hospital care of patients who may have spinal injuries are not supported by evidence. Let's look and see real quick. Look down here. They don't give me one second. Give me one second class. ASEP is the American College for Emergency Physicians. So so you know, uh, ASEP uh, recommends spine motion restriction over immobilizing attempts. So there it is. Like I told you earlier, they recommend spine motion restriction over immobilization attempts. So that's why you don't see the use of the backboard as much anymore. Here's some indication for spine motion restriction, not immobilization. Spine motion restriction. Follow local protocols, whatever your company tells you. Uh, use criteria to clear the spine. You must, uh, the patient must be reliable. Unreliable patients with a qualifying MOI must be provided with spine motion restriction. Spine motion restriction is necessary for an unreliable patient. That means this patient is not cooperating with you, has an altered mental status, unresponsive, they're unreliable. A patient with a neurological deficit, weakness, paralysis, um, things like of that nature, pain or tenderness near vertebral column, and distracting injuries. Reliable patient who communicates is not necessary. Spine motion restriction is not necessary for a reliable patient who can communicate, who has no spinal pain or tenderness, no abnormal neurological findings, and no distracting injury or intoxication. Nine times out of ten, if you get to the scene and you, your patient is up, walking around, sitting up, talking, alert, uh, alert and oriented times four, GCS 15, uh, they know where they're at, they know who they are, they know what happened, they probably do not need spine motion restriction. Now, you still need to ask questions like, does your back hurt? Is there any tenderness? Things of that nature. And if they do have those things, then obviously we're going to do some restriction, okay? Um, here's your protocols for SMR. Protocols uh, vary widely depending on your company. Uh, old spine motion restriction protocols have fallen out of favor due to poor outcomes. And they're referring to you, the use of those long backboards for immobilization. Okay, some tools for spine motion restriction. Cervical collars. They can increase intracranial pressure, so you must measure them and make sure you put them on right. You don't want to stretch anybody's neck or put any pressure on their, their cranium. Uh, cervical collars can cause pressure sores, so we don't want to keep them on too long. Uh, increase in difficulty in managing the airway with a cervical collar. Um, to just understand that, that when you go, if you're going to put a cer cervical collar on, uh, in my opinion, it, I would make sure that patient has a patent airway and they're, they're pushing air themselves without having to do a jaw thrust or anything like that. But if your patient um, is unresponsive and you have to put a C collar on, you're going to need some kind of airway adjunct. Uh, either an OPA or an MPA or maybe a king tube, just depending on their gag reflex so um, or their respiratory rate and things like that. So you need to, you need to be uh, aware of these kind of things because you put a C collar on somebody and you didn't get an airway and they're unresponsive. Well, you've just closed off that airway. 
So you have to take the collar off, put an adjunct in, you know, that sort of thing. And that's just going to be wasting time, possibly injure your patient, and things like that. All right. To size the seat collar, first draw an imaginary line across the top of the shoulders and bottom of the chin. I, I like how they worded that. So um, in the amount of chaos that you're going to be having on scene, please remember to draw your imaginary lines. Um, but, but yeah, just, just you have to imagine those things. Use your fingers to measure the distance from the shoulder to the chin. So from the top of the shoulder to the chin, we are going to use our fingers. Three, four, maybe five fingers, depending on the person. Then we're going to measure it on the, the collar. So we pick out our collar. We're going to select it. The distance between the sizing post or the back fastener and the lower edge of the rigid plastic should match that of the number of stacked fingers previously measured against the patient's neck, if it is that particular collar. A lot of different collars out there, so whenever you go to work for your company, you need to pull one out, look at it, figure out how to measure it, because you're going to look like a total idiot on the scene. I don't know I'm trying to offend you, but it, it happens to everybody, so don't worry about it. Um trying to size up that seat collar and your and your partner saying come on get the seat collar on and we're trying to get out of here and you're, you don't even know how to use it so please familiarize yourself with your equipment because that is not the only seat collar they make in this picture trust me i guarantee that's not the only seat collar they make all right assemble and perform preform the collar okay applying a cervical collar to a seated patient uh it's pretty pretty simple. This would be the easiest piece right here. You want to always put uh, on a seated patient, put the chin piece on first. So that way you know the front is on. Then wrap the collar around and secure it with the strap. Okay, recheck position of the patient's head and the collar. For proper alignment, make sure the patient's chin covers the central fastener of the chin piece. As shown here. Uh in further tightening, uh, if further tightening will uh, will cause hyperextension of the patient's head, select the next smaller size. So if you tighten it up and you see the patient's head start to go back, you're hyperextending it, so you need to resize it to fit smaller. All right, applying C collar to the supine patient. Now we're going to slide that collar underneath them while someone is holding spine motion restriction. Please do not lift the patient's head off of the floor or the ground. You have just defeated the purpose. You have just defeated the purpose. Position the collar so that your chin fits properly. Secure the collar by attaching the Velcro. Try not to use any uh, much gross motor movement as you are applying the C-collar to a supine patient. Move the collar around the patient's neck, not the patient's neck around the collar. All right, we're going to fasten it. All right, placing a supine patient on a long backboard. Um, and then they skipped over that. But we will go over that in class. It is not that difficult. But we must remember, always apply a C-collar before we log roll patients. Put them on a backboard. Okay, full body spinal restriction devices. So they're going to, um, excuse me, they're going to talk about it now. Long rigid backboards. There are many hazards and harmful effects associated with placing a patient on long rigid backboard. Alternative long devices for spine motion restriction, which are vacuum mattresses and scoop stretchers. Hey, scoop stretchers. Short spine motion restriction devices, as the KED is most common, and we're gonna show you those as well. These devices are rarely used, but they do come in handy, especially for little people or people sitting in vehicles. Some EMS systems might make it a part of their uh, spine motion restriction protocol, so if you need to be familiar with the proper use of this device, and that is true. Uh, the company that I work for does use the CAD device, and uh, they will make sure during training that you are familiar with it. Other SMR equipment, head stabilization devices, and straps. All right, the ambulatory patient. That is the patient, and I shouldn't have to tell you what ambulatory means, but I will. They're up and they're walking around. Uh, Self-restriction and assessing of an ambulatory patient. A reliable patient with no indications of spinal injury or reason for SMR does not require it. Like I told you earlier, if they're walking around, sitting up, all, then they're alert, oriented, they know what's going on, they possibly do not need spine motion restriction. 
Instruct the patient to hold his head and neck in neutral inline position during your evaluation. So as you are evaluating them, doing your assessment, have them hold their head and neck in an inline position. Okay, still on the ambulatory patient. Pre performing SMR for an ambulatory patient. Apply cervical collar if needed. Sit back on the stretcher. Have the patient lift their legs onto the stretcher. And have the patient lie back on the stretcher. Secure the patient to the stretcher. Anytime a patient gets on the stretcher, we will be securing them with the seat belts. Okay. Spine motion restriction for a supine or prone patient to be secured to a long backboard. Apply the cervical collar. That must be done before we put them on a long backboard. Log roll the patient. Position the board. Position the patient on the board. Secure the torso. Secure the head and the legs. And here we go. Getting ready. You see this uh, lady on the left has uh, manual inline stabilization. Plus, they have a C collar on. Please make sure you put a C collar on first. Look, they have help. The, the more help you have to log roll the patient, the better, because you don't want to hurt your back either. And you want to make sure that patient gets up high enough so that you can get her on the backboard. Patients roll to their side. Patients, uh, the backboard is placed underneath the patient here. They'll slide that backboard underneath the patient, and then they will roll log roll her back down on the board. And I will tell you this, that whenever uh, you log roll your patient back down on that board, they are not going to be perfectly centered on the board exactly where you need them. So you will have to, um, in between this step and this step, you will have to do a technique uh, where you move the patient up and down their whole body up and down the board until they are um, on the board to where you need them. And I will show you that in class. Um, and they have got her buckled down. We say nipple, navel, knees, and then the head. And so that her arms do not flail, they take them and take some cling wrap and wrap and tie her wrists together, not restricting her, but so she doesn't have to worry about keeping her arms up there. And you can also pad between the knees, below the knees, if she's uncomfortable, anything you can do, um, anything you can do to make your patient comfortable. Okay, I know that you know. Um, maybe they did something stupid to get hurt, and it's their fault, and they're they're idiots. But we're not going to treat them like that because that's not what we do. We're going to make them as comfortable as we can. We're not going to talk to them like they're idiots, and we're going to make sure that they get to the hospital stable and. Um, the doctors don't and nurses don't look at us like we're stupid. And there we go. Um, they're strapping down the head now. Um, and she says it's called the spider strap method uh, with Velcro. Um, you see the if you see the lady on the left, she's holding those foam round foam things. Um, that's what you're going to see now. They they come in a package. You open it up. It, they roll out. Slide it under her head. There's a piece of slides under her head that connects it. And it rolls up to the head, and you take those um, those two pieces of tape. Obviously, uh, you see the one on our forehead has a piece of foam underneath it, so it doesn't stick to her because that stuff will rip out hair and eyebrows and stuff like that. And then the one at the bottom tapes all the way around without the foam, so that it will stick. All right. Spine motion restriction for a supine prone patient with the backboard as a movement device only. Uh, log roll the patient on the backboard, secure the patient to the backboard, move the patient to the stretcher, place the backboard on the stretcher, instruct the patient to keep his toes, nose, and umbilicus lined up. Um, I don't know if, if you're, the only way I would not use a scoop stretcher in this situation would be if my company did not carry a scoop stretcher. Because a scoop stretcher, a scoop stretcher, I don't have to log roll the patient at all. I just lift them up on one side, paste, place half of the stretcher, lift up the other side, place half of the stretcher, connect it, and then we have a full stretcher. We lift them up, put them on the spine, on the stretcher itself, and then unhook it and pull the sides out, and there's no log rolling and gross motor movement. Um, Self-extrication from a vehicle. Self-extrication means the patient gets themselves out of the vehicle. Instruct the patient to hold his head and neck in a neutral inline position. That means their nose, chin is in line with their navel. 
Um, assess for pain or tenderness in their back and neck. Assess motor and sensory function. Apply a cervical collar. Instruct the patient to pivot his legs and body. And instruct the patient to stand straight up. Um, if you are sitting in a car the next time, uh, rotate your legs out while you're still sitting in the car and then try to stand straight up. You're going to hit your head. They're going to have to lean forward. That's the way it is. Have the patient rotate 180 degrees and then sit directly back onto the stretcher. So when they get up out of that car, they're self-extricating. Make sure you have your stretcher close as you can to the car so that they, they don't have to move and walk too much. Uh, have the patient lift his legs onto the stretcher and then lie back in a supine position. Um, if they're self-extricating, I wouldn't put them in a flat supine. I would maybe go semi-fowlers, just saying. Um, that's probably what your protocols are going to call for anyway. Okay. Secure the patient to the stretcher. Um, seated patient using a vest type device would be a KED device in this situation. Assess the back, scapula, arms, or clavicles before you apply the board. Never use a chin or chin cup or strap. Always tighten the torso and leg straps before securing the patient's head. Never pad between the cervical collar and the board. That is a the Ferno Kendrick extrication device, KED. Uh, what you are looking at is a upper torso device. It does not go any lower than the upper torso. Um, and that, that, that small portion up here is where we're going to secure the head around the cervical collar. And obviously this is our rigid board here for the back and then this goes around these white buckles the the uh, straps come underneath the legs through the groin and connect here to attach to your patient okay like I said you look at this device it's all nice and pretty and sitting out you need to familiarize yourself with it once you get to work with your company because God forbid you pull it out and don't know how to use it okay you see them sliding the board in See, that cervical collar is already in place. You see that EMT in the back seat holding that inline stabilization? Because that patient, just the way it is, especially us living in the South, those patients are going to want to help you do your job. And we don't need them moving around, looking around with the spinal injury. Okay, strapping them in. Uh, as Like I told you earlier, those straps go... Through the underneath the legs, got that head strapped in, tying those wrists together so that his arms don't flail. Because the last thing you want to do is patient that can't move. Um, you um, break their arm or don't strap their arms in so that they flail and get caught on something, get cut or broken. That would that'll be terrible. And they rotate the patient, and they're going to lay him on a long, rigid backboard. If you can't tell, it's right here, the long, rigid backboard. As you can see, they're working in tight spaces. If you're uncomfortable doing that, maybe the wrong profession for you. All right, a rapid extrication or rapid rollout. Three situations in which such movement is permissible. The scene is not safe. The patient's condition is so unstable that you need to move and transport them immediately. Or the patient blocks your access to a second, more seriously injured patient. This is the only time you're going to do a rapid extrication. All right. Bring the patient's head into a neutral inline position. This is best achieved from behind or at the side of the patient. Uh, perform a primary assessment and rapid physical exam, and then apply a cervical collar. Support the patient's thorax. Rotate the patient until her back is facing the open car door. Bring the patient's legs and feet up onto the car seat. They're going out upper body first onto that backboard. This is your rapid extrication. Bring the back, bring the board in line with the patient and against the buttocks. Stabilize the cot under the board. Begin to lower the patient onto the board. Please do not like try to put your long backboard and right there under her butt between that seat and think it's going to elevate itself. You're probably going to need to already have it on the stretcher 
so that it can elevate. Or if you can't get your stretcher down there, have three or four people holding it up so it doesn't fall. Because once you put her on it, if it's not something's not holding it up, it's going to hit the ground. Then you're going to have more injury. All right. Lower the patient onto the board. Depending on the structure of the car, it may be necessary to change positions to maintain inline stabilization while lowering the patient onto the board. Um, so if the structural features of the vehicle time, resources, and the patient's condition permit, it may be worthwhile to remove the roof before performing a rapid extrication. What they're saying here is if the patient is stable enough and they can hold uh, their own inline stabilization, or if you can get an EMT back there, they can hold it and you got time. Let me say that again. If you got time, it may be beneficial to have the fire department cut the roof off. So um, sometimes it has to happen. Sometimes cars are so mangled up that they have to be opened by the jaws of life and all the hydraulic tools that the fire, fire department has. There's just no way to get around it. And there you go. There's the uh, roof of the car has been cut off, and it's making it a lot easier. All right, helmets. Because of the EMTs, we are going to probably work some football games and such. Or we might even have to deal with a motorcycle crash here and there. All right, first assess the patient wearing the helmet. Assess the patient's mental status. Assess the patient's airway and breathing. Assess the fit of the helmet and the likelihood of movement. Determine your ability to gain access to the patient's airway. Leave the helmet in place if the helmet fits well and there is little or no movement. No impending airway problems. Helmet removal would cause further injury. You can provide SMR with the helmet on. It does not interfere with your ability to release, excuse me, to reassess the airway. Um, worked a football game where a kid, um, he was tackled and um, cut off the circulation to his uh, brain, the blood circulation to his brain, um, temporarily knocked him out. Um, he was conscious before he hit the ground. And then we went to him and left the helmet on, put him on a backboard, and carried him off the field. Um, we just left the helmet in place. So um, it's something to think about. We could we could get to his airway and things like that. So, All right, remove the helmet if it interferes with your ability to assess or reassess airway and breathing. If it interferes with your ability to adequately manage the airway, it does not fit well. It interferes with spine motion restriction, and the patient is in cardiac arrest. All right, two basic types of helmets, sports helmets and motorcycle helmets. Face masks on football helmets can be removed by cutting the plastic clips. There are helmet uh, face mask removal tools if you want to go that far and get one, um, but some, some of the helmets are different, so um, you may just have to get some uh, handy-dandy um, cutters to cut the clips. Uh, motorcycle helmets generally cover the full face and prevent access to the airway, as seen here. So, one rescue applies stabilization by placing hands on each side of the helmet with fingers on the patient's mandible to prevent movement. See those fingers right here on that mandible? The second rescuer places one hand on the mandible at the angle of the jaw. With the other hand, the second rescuer holds the occipital region. This maneuver transfers the stabilization responsibility to the second rescuer. The rescuer at the top begins to remove the helmet, pulling the sides apart to clear the ears and allowing the second rescuer to readjust his hand position around the mandible and under the occipital region. This is not going to be a fast, fluid movement. This is going to take you some time so that you do not jeopardize spine motion, uh, spinal injury. So you need to readjust, hand placement, that sort of thing. Take your time. Throughout the removal process, the second rescuer maintains inline stabilization from below to prevent head tilt. After the helmet has been removed, the rescuer at the top replaces his hands to either side of the patient's head with palms over the ears taking over stabilization. 
All right. Equipment intensive sports like football, hockey, and lacrosse injuries. It is important that the AT athletic trainer that all high school and college and pro sports should have. It's important that the athletic trainer and the EMT are prepared to work together. When appropriate, helmets and shoulder pads should be removed before transport. Removal should be performed by a minimum of three trained rescuers. Several tools can be used to remove the face mask. Just like I said, football, there's a lot of companies out there, a lot of different companies making football helmets that make their helmets different. The tool you buy may be only for one, that will only work on one type of helmet. And you get out there and there's different types of helmets, then you won't, your tool doesn't work. So um, you need to, to make yourself aware of these things. Spine motion restriction for the player. Remove the face mask and the helmet, pad beneath the head. Remove shoulder pads and the pad, uh, and pad, um, whatever that means. Remove the shoulder pads and any pads around the uh, player and apply a cervical collar. Uh, infants and children, pad from the shoulders to the heels of an infant or child if necessary to maintain neutral inline stabilization. Look at that patient. If their uh, spine is not in line and stable, you can pad underneath them. Make sure the cervical collar fits before applying it to an infant or child. There are infant cervical collars out there. You need to make yourself familiar with those. Extrication from a car seat. Car seats involved in crashes may have lost integrity. I will tell you this, that when I used to install and teach the car seat class, as a policeman, we taught that if a car seat was involved in a crash, to discard the car seat, no matter how uh, severe the crash was, just in case the integrity is lost. God forbid you put a car seat back in there and the integrity is lost and there's another crash that occurs and the child is in it and the car seat doesn't work. All right. EMT1 stabilizes the car seat in an upright position and applies manual stabilization to the child's head and neck. EMT2 prepares equipment, then loosens or cuts the car seat straps and raises the front guard. The cervical collar is applied to the child as EMT1 maintains manual stabilization of the head and neck. As EMT-1 maintains manual stabilization, EMT-2 places the child safety seat on the center of the backboard and slowly tilts it into the supine position. See, they're using the car seat. Hint, hint, hint. The EMTs are careful not to let the child slide out of the safety seat. For a child with a large head, place a towel under the area where the shoulders will eventually be placed on the board to prevent the child's head from tilting forward. EMT-1 maintains manual stabilization and calls for a coordinated long axis move onto the board. So they're going to work together to slide that child from that car seat onto that board. And look, they even have padding ready. EMT-1 maintains manual stabilization as the move onto the board is completed with the child's shoulders over the folded towel. EMT-1 Maintain stabilization as EMT2 places rolled towels or blankets on both sides of the child. And this is uh, this is kind of funny. Let's see if you get it. Uh, EMT1 maintains stabilization as EMT2 straps or tapes the child onto the board at level or of the upper chest, pelvis, and lower legs. Do not strap across the abdomen. I don't know what that is, but... Maybe that's not the whole abdomen. I guess they're calling that the pelvis, but looks like part of the stomach to me. But okay. EMT-1, guess what? Maintains stabilization as EMT-2 places roll towel on both sides of the head. Then tapes the head securely in place across the forehead and cervical collar. Do not tape across the chin to, pro to avoid pressure on the neck. And they're going across the chin. But I didn't write these, so... All right, case study conclusion. Angela applies a cervical collar after assessing the neck as Sarah continues manual stabilization of the spine. Since the patient is stable, the EMTs quickly splint both ankles to prevent further pain and damage upon moving her. 
Sarah and Angela apply a long backboard for spine motion restriction and begin transport. At the hospital, the patient is found to have compression fractures of L3 and L4. L stands for lumbar. You need to know these things. She requires surgery for both the ankle fractures and spinal injury. Our lesson summary, and I hope you had the opportunity to answer those questions. Spine injuries can lead to permanent disability. Proper management to avoid movement of the spine is imperative. Spinal cord injuries can be partial or, or complete. Spinal cord injuries can cause loss of motor and sensory function. Complications of spinal cord injury include respiratory failure and neurogenic shock. That is it for spinal injury. I will see you next time.